you yeah, probably should be able to hear me at the front anyway, but good morning everyone. And I'd love for you to give a warm welcome to Thomas Mijanovic to his talk on cross-platform development in QML. Please give him a warm welcome. Hello everyone. We are all kind of alive, kind of awake after last night's penguin dinner. Nearly. Uh, right, we might just take a quick poll before we get started. Who here has used uh, QML or Qt Quick before? Hands up. No one? one? Excellent. Well, we might start with just a bit of an overview and a basic intro into the language just to get everyone else up to speed. Development. Anyone used any kind of Qt tools before? Anyone who's done any JavaScript development before? Everyone else, not a worry. This is very accessible, very simple. We're going to start a bit low level. Everyone is bored by the, um, the beginning of this tutorial. Feel free to charge ahead a bit. Um, we'll just do a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, we've got some SDKs being around. We have 32 Intel AM architectures. If anyone still needs one of those. Other than that, if you've got one of these fancy laptops with no optical drives, we've got a hard drive being passed around, feel free to grab the SDKs. You won't actually need everything installed just yet, um, because everything that we're going to be doing works on a normal desktop device. We'll be doing our development on desktop. And later on, towards the second phase of this tutorial, about 40 minutes in, um, we'll switch to playing around with mobile devices. Is uh, Qt So the question was, um, if installing Qt Creator at the moment would be sufficient, that's all you need right now. If your normal package manager has it, either QML Scene and your favorite text editor, or Qt Creator. Anything else you might possibly want is for deploying to various mobile devices and embedded devices. So you feel free to grab those later on. So right now, if everyone who's going to be interactively taking part just wants to either make the decision now, you're going to work with uh, Qt Creator, the IDE, or work with QML scene from the command line. We'll just do a basic uh, familiarization of how that's going to go, so we don't have to interrupt ourselves later on. Just one moment, we're having problems with the microphone. Okay, no problems there. Is that coming through now? Uh, press the button. Is that coming through now? Fantastic. All right, everyone can hear me? All right, we'll charge on then. So before we get any further, um, oh, I'm leaking all my personal details in the bottom, that's all right. So the only thing, at the moment, we're not going to be making any kind of project. Just make sure, either through a key binding or through the menu, you work out how to run QML scene. As long as you save a document um, with a QML extension and click this, it'll run all of our demos on your desktop normally. We'll go that to start with. All right, so we'll start with a basic overview of QML. Some of us have heard of it before, some of us haven't. So it's a relatively recent language. It's a declarative language, so rather than being concerned with um, imperatively setting up our entire environment. Those of you who have used maybe uh, C++ and Qt to set up something kind of similar to what we're going to be doing today or most other languages. You're actually trying to build everything from the ground up with the declarative language. You're only expressing the final state that you want and you're letting something else handle the implementation of how you get there, which is part of what makes this so simple to work with. And usually a lot of this, all of the scripting involved, it's all JavaScript or a special runtime called Qt Quick to handle all the graphics side. Everything's interpreted at runtime, nothing's compiled. It actually ends up being a lot faster than most compiled languages though. The JavaScript engines are very highly optimized and the Qt Quick scene graph, um, as long as you've got decent OpenGL drivers, it's a lot faster than most other solutions out at the moment as well. Usually QML is used for developing GUI apps or just the GUI front ends to other apps. There are plenty of bindings to other languages but if you're happy to use JavaScript for your logic, it can be used as a standalone language as well. Right, so those of you who are familiar with Qt's history over the past few years, knew that Qt got to a state best expressed by the following fancy video. Hey, Jean-Claude! You look really warm. 
worn out today? Do you have to finish your program on three different platforms and in several languages too? Is your boss breathing down your neck? Your troubles are over! We have the solution for you! Look at the screen! Right, we might leave that there before we run through the whole ad. So the state of things at the time was you had this one toolkit called Qt, which you could use to write almost platform independent code with just a few hundred if defs now and there for obscure embedded devices. And you build that for a variety of systems and everything would kind of work. Until a company, you may have heard of them, they used to be big in mobile, called Nokia, acquired Qt and thought, this is great, but we can do much better. And under Nokia's ownership, that's when QML was released, they wanted something fast and agile. Ideally, they wanted a native interpreter pre-installed on every mobile device. Otherwise, you use some boilerplate code. You compile one launcher, um, pretty much your interpreter for that platform, and then everything else is standard. You use the same code, no if defs, no changes, and everything runs nice, fast, fluidly with the mobile platform in mind. So you can use QML for mobile apps, desktop apps, you can, even website bindings, you can do web pages with it. This is basically what a QML file looks like. You've got a whole lot of import statements up the top um, and various objects nested down the bottom. Now that looks a bit messy, I don't know about you, that's a bit hard to understand. So let's just go to an example. That's pretty much it. Ignore the import statements for now. You need a magic line at the top of your script. And that's it, you pick one object, in this case, a rectangle. Um, so if you want, open up your editor, and we'll give something like this a go. I'm just going to copy and paste this code. All right, so if you put that much in, and you run that with QML scene, you should get a nice yellow rectangle with some nice blue text over the top. Right, it's a bit of a check to see that everyone's able to use the tools and kind of keep up. How's everyone going with that? Have you got something similar on your screens? Um, you use and then ah, in that case, rather than making a new project, which will be fine, it'll set up your build environment, all this fancy code, let you do all these fancy things, maybe just create a new file. Actually, ignore all that. You know what, if it's going to be easier, just make a, create a file externally, give it a .qml extension, and just open it with Qt Creator. Have I lost anyone there? Yeah. All right, we'll forget it. Just a uh, new file of projects, uh, Qt, QML file, Qt Quick 1. Choose that. They're going to want some of that for that to be saved. Give it a fancy name. Put .qml on the end. Uh, normally, we'd give a capitalized first name, it doesn't really matter. And there you go. It'll just give you some boilerplate code, which will do something kind of similar. I'll, all right. Back to the other example, or show again how that works? OK. So the example was something like this. So we have an object, in this case it's a rectangle, we've given it an ID, and we've given it a property, a color. In there we've nestled a child object, we turn ID, we've given it some other properties. So, right, so if you want to have a line ending rather than a new line, you can use a semicolon, kind of similar to JavaScript. I was a bit space constrained on my slides, due to the resolution we're using, I'll make it a bit nicer. No, it makes no difference. This isn't Python. You can put as much or as little white space as you like. <laughs> Sorry, Python guys. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. It doesn't care. It's not Perl. You can forget the semicolons, add the semicolons, whatever you like. It's not really picky. So if you put something similar to that, 
and then you run QML scene, you should get exactly that. A rectangle, a yellow rectangle with some blue, with the words blue and blue over the top. Okay. Ah, oh, fantastic. Anyone else want an SDK later on? Just come and grab that hard drive. Right? Hands up if you're not there. That's all right. Another couple of seconds. Everyone else, I'm just going to throw some other properties in. That text is a bit small. So this is a nested property here. You can try and change the style of your text. You can use the autocomplete to have a play around. You might think your rectangle is a bit small. Everyone kind of there? Oh, running it. So I've just put a shortcut for going to external, Qt Quick, and Qt Quick 2 Preview. And you should see this fancy window popping up. And if you're deploying to a platform which naturally perform, supports QML, such as uh, Mer. Sailfish, Plasma Active, Ubuntu Mobile, you know, all the common mobile phones that everyone has these days. <laughs> Otherwise, later on, you'll just build uh, some basic, um, we'll use some basic boilerplate code to build us either in Objective C or in Java, some kind of interpreter that'll do the job for us instead. And if nothing happens when you go to external QTQ, uh, with QML scene? So you've run QML scene and nothing's happened? Nothing. All right, I'll just have a quick look. Have you saved the file? Yep. Oh. All right. Unfortunately, it doesn't work on the active state of your document. You have to save the file oh, okay. cool. and then give it another go. Still not working? No worries. So you've done QML scene on the file. Up right. Ah, uh, oh, I'm trying to run QML four. Uh, uh, if you try dash Qt five on the end, are you using a distro package? Yeah. Mine, mine was silently complaining that I'd use lowercase t on the text instead of uppercase t. Ah. Uh, popping up in Qt. Yeah. Dash Qt five. <laughs> but, That's really quite strange. I don't know. Unfortunately, if you're using distro packages, which is usually quite helpful. Sometimes they have some weird quirks, to just, so they can package Qt 3, 4, 5, 2, 1, all at the same time. So let us know now. Now that everyone's on the same page, we can motor through a little bit more. All right. All right, so everyone has your fancy yellow rectangle with your fancy blue text. No? Well, no problems. We've got lots of time today. It's, uh, it, just, it says it's starting out. I've saved it. Um, and nothing's popping up. Scene in the viewer and nothing happens. Just, if you go to a... Can you find the path of the, wherever the binary is gone and just try and call it externally on the file? Uh, yep, so, so I'll, um, it's called um, QML scene. QML SCENE. Oh, okay. All right. So if you, if you can do that for now and later on, we might work out what's wrong with Key Creator. So everything right in the middle row? That's right, just a moment. Unfortunately, as with a lot of solutions, it's harder to set up your environment than it actually is to code something. Uh, it's, you might, that's, um, needs to be font, F-O-N-T. <coughs> and then see... And then see if that runs. It's if you go to Tools. At the top. Tools, yes, external. Cute quick. QML scene. Maybe save it first. So quick file and save. And try that again.
Hmm. That's funny. Um, so this gentleman in front of us had the same problem. Are you able to open the terminal? Yeah, so it turned out, in my case, to be that it was just a file outside of the project, and so then it was looking for project directory slash... Ah, uh, so okay. Slash QT Actually? Sorry, what, what was your name? Can you please uh, leave your hands just to do the same thing that we did before? Okay. I honestly have never seen Kilmel Puppet before. All you should need, if you install Cute Creator, it should install it, pull in everything else it needs. You won't need most of what it's trying to pull in now. So it should just be Cute Creator, no dashes, nothing else. Otherwise, try Cute Dash Creator. Oh, you've installed it? Oh, you've got some. Fancy graphical tool here. Yeah, yeah. Are you using the design function? That's so you can draw everything by hand. Try going to edit instead. Yeah, and how do I run that? And, um, oh, that's lowercase t. Lowercase t, yeah. For cute quick up the top. Oh. All right, so everyone's aware um, the cute creator ID, IDE isn't too different from your normal word processor. Oh, if you see a squiggly red underline, that means something isn't spelt correctly. Okay, and how do I run it? So, tools. Tools, tools. Oh, the menu seems to be... Yeah, so it's, it's, well, it's a, it's oh, a one, two thing. So, so oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so I'll try to... Yeah, um, Alt-T, maybe? Alt-T. Yeah. Or Command-T, depending on how you bound it. No, that's not it. Alt-T, maybe? Yeah, I'll put something in there. Alt-T. Yeah. Yeah. Alt-T. Yeah. Alt yeah. Alt oh, I'm sorry. There should be... A, there's a drop-down menu, file menu, up the top, edit menu, tools menu. Can you turn it on? I guess it by default it's turned off, is it? It should be that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. I've never used Unity before. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is on Mate, but it's. Oh, on Mate. Okay. Uh, it doesn't work. Well, you can always, if you can open the terminal up and find yeah. where the where yeah. it is. QML, just run QML scene or QML scene dash Qt5 on the file, oh. and you won't need to use the IDE to run anything. So if I go what? Sorry. You find? Do you have? Is it in your path? QML scene. QML s. Q Yes, yeah. and fantastic. And then just run that and yeah. pick and just uh, give, point it to your file and it should run. Well, All right, so now that change you meant oh, for yeah. capital T, just save yeah. that and it should run. Yeah, okay, no problem. Thank you. All right, excellent. All right, I think most of us are there. It's all right. Once you get it to work once, every future change is pretty simple. All right, so I say. <laughs> so, that's, uh, all right, well, given everyone's background, we'll ignore all the scary stuff for now. Okay, objects. Everything's pretty much an object, but, um, so you have some kind of object, like our rectangle. You can give it an ID. Generally, you wouldn't need to, unless you're going to refer to it later on. Oh, bad luck to anyone who wants a copy of the slides later on. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, so your properties, say so we can do width. <laughs> I don't know, whatever we had before. Comment characters. Everyone, document everything. You're all at the talks on, at the mini comps at the talks yesterday. Or you can do the other JavaScript style ones. All right, so what we always have, we have our objects. We give it a few properties. Um, function methods, which we'll get into later on. Those of you who write JavaScript, you can run a JavaScript function in here. Oops. So, don't have to write this down. And signals which we'll ignore till later on. And child objects. If you want another rectangle in here, you're just the same as we did for the text before. So this object is a child of the one above it. That's its parent. It's a part of it. It's um, painted on top of it, and so on and so forth. Sorry, what I'm writing now? Yes, 
All right, well, I'll, I'll cut that out and I'll fix that later on. Classic programming case. We'll be doing functions in a moment. So something like this, and then obviously if you want to do more rectangles, you can keep, you can do an even smaller one inside that one, so on and so forth. Um, so you have your object's name, some curly braces, and then property, colon, value, property, colon, value, property, colon, value, and so on and so forth. Now, we'll get to a problem soon. So we'll go back to our very nice example. And we have our text. Let's say we want some more text. Now we want... Um, Somebody pick a colour. We've already got blue. Red, thank you. <laughs> Red. So there we go. I've just added this. So this is great. Now we're going to have a rectangle and blue text and red text. And um, that's kind of okay until I try and increase the size of my text to the same as the other one. And we'll see. They overlap. So there's no point having all these different objects if we can't actually position them anywhere. Otherwise, they're just going to overlap over each other. So we'll quickly look at positioners. Scarier than it sounds. So um, the, the easiest type of one actually is in this example. We'll just go back to what we were doing before. And the easiest thing you can do, you can give it an x and a y value. So x, I don't know, 50. Y, 50. And the same thing, I'll click through in case anyone missed it before. It's external, cute quick, QML scene, or just call that from the command line on your file. There we go, it's 50 pixels down, 50 pixels to the side. Nice and easy. But manually position everything with pixels gets a bit awkward after a while. So we're going to use something we call for anchors after I don't switch to a TTY. <laughs> Sorry about that. Making the, probably broken the recording system, no. All right, so the concept of anchors is, um, it'll be easier once we run an example. Um, you can attach an object or anchor an object to an edge of another object. You can anchor to its left edge, its right edge, its top, its bottom, its vertical center, its horizontal, sorry, vertical center, horizontal center, or its direct center. Or you can just say, fill the entire area of the object under it. So, just copy and paste this one here. All of you poor people have to type it out for exercise reasons. Oh. And don't worry if you're importing Cute Quick 2.1 or 2.0 or 2.0 anything else at this stage. There, and now we have a silver rectangle which looks like the same color as the window, so I might just change that to purple. Haven't had purple yet. Purple rectangle in the backgrounds. We have a red rectangle which we haven't positioned anywhere, so it's in the top left corner. And we've anchored this aqua rectangle to the left edge of the to the right hand edge of the left one, and its right anchor is on the right hand edge of this window here. So we'll just uh, make some more changes to demonstrate it. Say we want to anchor it to the bottom as well. And notice, rather than using an ID for this rectangle, which I could, I've gone a bit ahead of myself, and I've stuck in this little special keyword, parent. So purple rectangle is the parent of this funky aqua rectangle down here. So if I don't want to bother giving an ID just for one of its kids to refer to it, I can just say parent. If I want to be specific, I can put in the full ID from up here. So we'll rerun this now and look at the change. And oh, that's the problem. I gave it a height. We'll get rid of the height and anchor it to the top. as well. And there we go. 
So this aqua rectangle, its top edge is anchored to the top of the purple one. Its bottom edge is anchored to the bottom of the purple one. Left edge is anchored to the right-hand side of this red one. And right edge is anchored to the right-hand side of this purple one. And using these anchors, doesn't matter if you resize the window, if you've got a responsive de a device and its dimensions change, if you specify a fixed width in pixels, something will stay at that fixed width, like this 50 pixel wide red rectangle. Everything else is fluid, dynamic, and obeys its anchors. So this is going to be quite handy for if you want something that works on a tablet and on a phone. So the only other thing you might want to do is give it some margins. Because we've got, whoop, that was bad. There we go. So you can see some of our lovely purple as well. We've got a little border all the way around with 20 pixels. Is the video feed affected? It's all right, just here. All right, no problems. Now, a bit of shorthand. Rather than typing anchors dot, anchors dot, anchors dot every time, we can just type and so on and so forth and put it inside curly braces. All right, you have to type it as well. I won't be lazy. I won't use any shortcuts. We'll give it a new set of anchors and see what happens. So... Okay, 50 points without running it. What's this going to do? What's, gonna, what's the aqua rectangle going to do in terms of the red one? That's not what code is. We just run it and see what happens, right? <laughs> there we go. So we've anchored it to the top of the purple one. That's its parent. The bottom of the red one. The left of the parent, which is the purple one. And the right of the red one. So, of course, it perfectly covers the red rectangle without specifying any widths, pixels, or anything funny like that. All right, everyone's still on the same page? All right, excellent. So, this is about 10% of what I plan to do so far, and 90% adapting to what's going on in the room. That's no problems at all. If it gets boring, let me know, and I'll shift gears again. I have all these, my slides are that boring anyway. So, and also, if we, as convenience, we've also got anchors.fill. And you can fill the red one and do the same thing. Or you can fill the purple rectangle. Is there a background as well? Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Say if you wanted this in the backgrounds. So you can see what we're doing. I'm going to introduce another property, opacity. It's a value from 0 to 1. So in this case, I'll give it some borders so we can see some edges as well. Some margins, sorry. So there we go, it's filling the purple rectangle, it's covering the red one, we've got a margin around it. But what if we wanted that to be the background? Say for example our root element wasn't a rectangle, it was something else. Or we wanted to put some text and we want the rectangle to be a child of a text object and not obscure the text. We'll just uh, change that now and make everyone's life difficult. So I'm going to put a text element around this red rectangle. Sorry, I normally don't use uh, Kit Creator. I use whoops, something else, which is a bit more difficult to introduce people to. So I don't know how to auto indent. So I will go like a peasant and do this, and this, and this, and um, give it some text. And we'll see what that looks like. We've got hello there. And this red rectangle goes over the top. And if the red rectangle was a bit wider, say we made this 150, it starts completely covering the other, the other text up. 
And if we instead do something more interesting, say we wanted a nice red border around our text. And for some reason we had to do the text first to make the rectangle a child. You can fill the parent. And another property, I'm too lazy to delete that. So I'm just going to hide it by setting visible to false. So all of these properties are always attached to these objects. They've just got a default value. By default, if you put something in, you obviously want it to be visible. So visibility is set to true. If you want to change it, you just put the property and set it to false. And there we go. We can't see our text whatsoever. So what we have to do instead is give this not just an X or Y value, a Z value. So you put Z to negative 1. It uses traditional Z ordering, so the level of the screen is Z equals 0. Anything positive puts it in front, anything negative puts it behind. We've given that a negative Z value, and suddenly hello there is in front again. So that answer the question? Fantastic. Look at us. We've already got something that looks like a dodgy smartphone app. That all we need to do is put 10 ads down the bottom and punch the monkey, and we're there. We're making money. All right. Well. That's not, we're not quite there yet, but um, that's, yeah, multiple objects, anchoring, positioning. There's another, we might just switch back to the slides for a sec. After that, positioners. It's a bit boring manually specifying anchors. If you want just a, a nice column of text, one line after the other, or rectangles and text, because rectangles and text are the only fun things we're working with so far. Um, we can do that too. So as you can see, the root element can be anything you like. It's something without a color, so QML scene doesn't know what color to make the background, so it just leaves it white. If we don't make it a rectangle or a picture, it'll pick your default system background color. We can make text the root element. We can make anything the root element. If it's non-visual, things will get a bit funky. Other than that, so we've got a column. All I've done is given the column a width so it knows how wide to make the window. I don't have to give it a height. It's by default using the height of all its children put together. And plus the spacing. If I take this spacing away, if I make it something ridiculous, you can't even see the next object because it's 500 pixels off the screen. There we go. There's the text. Put spacing down to 5, and it does what you expect. Everything's nice and tightly packed. That's a column. A row, pretty similar. It'll, it'll automatically take the width of its children, so let's give it a height instead. And there we go. That's probably a bit too high. And it's put all our three items in a row. So if we don't want to fix anchors, and we definitely want things in a row with fixed spacing, we can just do it like that. There are even funkier and even cooler ways to lay things out, but they start getting a bit more complicated, and you have to start importing extra modules and things like that, so we'll get to that a bit later on. All right, we might ditch these slides in a sec. No, I think we'll just ditch the slides now and keep soldiering on here. All right, so that's a bit fun, but it's a bit boring. We might want to put some pictures in. Ah, who knows a good picture, a good URL for something on the internet? LCA logo. There we go, LCA logo. Yeah. Let me just uh, off to another screen and um, find the URL for that. 50 points if someone finds it before me. Please be something we can all type. Copy image location. There, that's not that bad. So here we go. Now we've noticed something. If we've got some sizing issues here. But if we drag this over, oh, it still doesn't work. We might switch this out from a row back to a rectangle. Sorry for all the changes on the fly. So no spacing. All these things obviously are now going to be on top of each other again. 
So sorry if you've been you've invested your heart and soul into all these other children. I'm just going to get rid of them, and I'm going to stick it in the middle of the rectangles. And defying me, it's not working. That's bizarre. All right. You know what? They don't have any kind of hot link protection on their images, do they? No. I hope not. Just uh, get another picture. Sorry about that. Here we go. Bob Young's face. How does that sound? Still doesn't want to show. This is the worst demo ever. <laughs> it normally... It'll asynchronously load pictures. Um, thanks for bringing that up. We've just had a, the point raised because it's not local. Could that be why the image isn't displaying? What should happen is it um, displays later on. It delays it, loads it asynchronously. Working for the, it's working for you up the back there. Is it working for everyone else? Some yes, some no. Weird caching problems. It's working. Does it come up straight away? All right, so I've got some weird cache of firewall problem with my system, but if it works for everyone else, it works for you? Oh, you're in Windows and you're still installing? All right, well, let us know when you get there. Hopefully you've been following what we're doing, and um, we'll get you up to speed. All right, so I'm going to use a local image. Sorry about that, everyone. Everyone else can keep using Bob, Yo Bob Young's fantastic face. Uh, Everyone, find your favorite picture, nothing, nothing obscene, nothing too embarrassing on your computer, and grab the URL for that instead. If you put it in the local directory which you're working in, you don't have to give it any paths. It'll just, it does relative paths as well. So I'm going to find a picture. Since it hates me running off the web, so everyone can do the same thing, I'm going to have to grab a local one as well. And this is something, unfortunately, to be aware of. This is one of the corner cases with mobile devices. Things usually work. But if you've got a weird phone from one weird manufacturer with one weird firewall, you actually might have to test it on that device. You might test it on, say, 100 other Android phones and it works. If one guy's complaining on the App Store that it doesn't work, he might not just be crazy. He most likely is just crazy, but he might not just be crazy. All right, so let's find. Here we go, a bit sad. Let's get a picture of a mop. We all like mops, don't we? Stick that in my images folder. Oops. And that was. Huh. So you can all stare at my private file hierarchy. There we go. Oh, I had it in the demos folder. So there you go. You can use a relative path if you store your picture somewhere relative to your actual project. That makes sense. There we go. A nice, lovely mop. You know what? A mop that just stands still is pretty boring. Mop should be doing something. So. We don't need that. And um, no, that won't move anywhere. Give it a duration in milliseconds. You can probably guess what's going to happen here. Absolutely nothing. Thanks a lot, Mob. Now, I am going to cheat. I'm going to use the same code I used for the slideshow to change slides earlier. And I'm going to copy and paste that because this mop does not like me. All 
All right, so, oh, apparently we've changed the syntax for how we do things. So, that's all right. We will give it a name. Okay, and what we're going to do, we're going to start it later on. One extra thing, if you want to do some special initialization only when your scene is ready, don't ask why it's called this, just accept it for now because it's crazy. Component.onCompleted. And here, if you know JavaScript, you can put a nice message to your terminal. And we can give a JavaScript command to our number animation. And that should work beautifully for us. And, ah, oh, that would be why. There we go. So that was really, really short. We might make that a bit longer. <laughs> Let's loop that 50 times. Wow. Do you know what? We will make it a bit faster. Oops. Do you know what I think this needs? I think this needs some music. Who's got the Sorcerer's Apprentice on their laptops? <laughs> Fortunately, I do. Now, unfortunately, nothing in normal Qt Quick can play any kind of sounds or video. But if we import... Can't want to complete for me. No, oh, it doesn't like me. All right, we'll get back to that. I've obviously didn't install something. That's an animation, so we can animate there if you want to change it to the X direction. Simple thing. Now look at it, it's gracefully going from side to side. Now, property bindings. Other than anchors, we can do things here as well. We don't, what if we don't want it to go just negative 20 um, to 20? We want it to go the full width of this parent element. It's boring without a color, isn't it? you think this will work? No. What's a weird color? Oh, orange. We haven't had orange yet. So, actually, we'll go from the start. We'll go zero to and this way, even if we end up resizing the window on the fly. It'll keep adapting. Let's make it wider. There it goes. It keeps going wider. We'll make it narrower. Once my window manager stops thinking, it knows what to do better than me. And it will go narrow as well. Um, and we can refer to other properties this way. And that's part of the whole declarative nature. Rather than us hard coding everything from the start, we just uh, pick a value from somewhere else and refer to it. And if that changes, everything else updates and propagates through as well. Now, what if we want this animation to stop? Let's add a button. No, actually, we're not doing buttons yet. Let's add a mouse area. Have a guess what this does. Mop. We'll make it fuller than the mop. Now, it says mouse area, but if you use your finger on the touch screen, it ends up doing the same thing. Now, this is a signal. This, the mouse area has a signal called clicked. When something tricks the signal, it fires an on-clicked event, and we can define what it does here. So, on-clicked, we can put a log to the console for people who are reading that. And 
and say transition Y, the best name in the world. And stop it. No, not start, stop. So there we go, crazy mop. We click, it stopped. Here you already have a game that's better than a lot of the rubbish that you can get on nowadays on smartphones. If you don't click the mop, it doesn't stop. Click the mop, fantastic, you win. Seriously, play with that a little bit. Make it bounce around the screen, use other weird animations. If by default it's doing a linear animation, you can choose different easing types, elastic, quantitative, quadratic, and that swacks some ads down the bottom, and that's about 10% of the apps in the Android App Store. But we want to do something a, lot, a bit less useless than that. But what if we want to restart it again? Uh, you know what, we'll enter it again. We'll just show it. Funky rectangle dot color equals purple. So you just keep adding extra anything here. It'll just run imperatively. You can put a whole script of changes in there. It'll just execute it one after the other like any normal programming language. First it stops the animation, then it makes the background purple. Um, what we can do here, one last thing, JavaScript loops, while the engine's really fast, it can be a little bit crazy. It's much more efficient to um, use property binding. So if you want to change the speed, um, depending on whether the background of the rectangle is orange or purple, you can put an if we can put a thing here or an if statement. We just go duration. Um, So those of you who said you've used JavaScript before, this would be familiar to you. So what this does, is not much. So that's the problem with not sticking to your um, original slides. Ah, oh, it's orange to start with, isn't it? I don't remember if I can make. So it's going fairly slow as it is, and as soon as it changes color, it goes ridiculously slow. And we've stopped the animation, so we can't tell the difference. We'll stop doing that. All right. Now, how's everyone been going along? Is everything kind of making sense so far? Yeah. Now, that's the basics of the language. That's OK. There are a few more things. Um, you can have um, other positioners, list views. So if you want to have a large list of, say, contacts or from a database, um, you can go through and you can scroll off the screen without you having to do screen management or do your own scroll bars. We can keep going for basics of QML. Or we can go straight to the stuff that you're more likely to use for a mobile app. We can look at our toolbars, buttons, text fields, text editors, and go in that direction. So who wants to, who wants to keep going with basic QML? Hands up. Who wants to go to cooler stuff? Fantastic. Good. I was about to shoot myself. <laughs> All right. Now we go. Finally, new project. And we want our application. Cute quick application. All right, so find somewhere to stick it. All right, so you've all, you're all at this stage so far. Pick somewhere to put it. Give it a name. Good. All right. Now, there's something called cute quick controls. I'll just go a bit. No, I won't bother putting the slides up. I'll just rattle on a bit for a while. What we just did now, if a little bit further, that's the state that things are in when Nokia finally decided they were going to shoot themselves in the foot and blow this investment they just made. And that's the state that a lot of things were after that. But people looked at it and thought, you know what? What's a button? A button is just a rectangle with fancy border images with a mouse area underneath it. And they started using these existing components and these existing objects to make other objects. And they were building all kinds of funky things, 
you know, uh, all kinds of widgets that we're used to on the desktop, new widgets just for mobile. If you want to make a slider, you can just you make a circle or a rectangle with rounded corners, put it on another rectangle of another color, change its position using anchors or animations or X coordinates. But in other words, it's a lot of fiddly work to do it all from these basic elements that we've been playing with. But they did it anyway for the Nokia N9. They did it in a completely separate and incompatible way for Symbian. And then guess what? It was on in another incompatible way for KDE Plasma. Another completely incompatible way for Android. You're getting the idea here? And guess what? Ubuntu Mobile has got everything in QML, incompatible again. Um, everything like the Sailfish OS, incompatible again. BlackBerry, its native, native apps are all in QML, but they call them Cascades and used a different way again. And eventually, when Qt 5 came out, they said, guys, this is crazy. Step one, I took everything, and the worst thing was none of this worked on desktop, it only worked on mobile. So you had to physically have a mobile device in your hand to develop with to see what was going to happen, or run some virtual machine or simulator to see how things work. They all sat down, um, a lot of the Qt 5 developers, they thought we're going to make a basic set of components that should work everywhere. That's what we're about to look at here, they're called Qt Quick Components. Um, same syntax, all we're going to change is the styling. The reason I said we need Qt 5.4 for today, it works in Android from 5.2 and 5.3, but they looked exactly the same as they looked on your desktop. So you had a nice Android button with the same width for a finger to press on it. You had some tiny desktop button you had to get your little stylus out and press on. Now you don't even have to do that manually. They've got a nice Android style. They have an iOS style. They have uh, even a Windows RT style. You can make a Metro app. from The same code can make a Metro app, an Android app, a desktop app, an iOS app, and pretty soon uh, Blackberry, Plasma, and Mer and Selfish apps. And all you have to do is maybe a couple of tweaks for your project file. You copy the same cool QML from project to project. What we're doing now, you will create a separate project as we're about to do for all your separate files. That's just so you get your um, platform dependent boiler code. That's just going to launch everything, set whatever permissions you need, whatever housekeeping, and then just run your QML. So I'll get back to it, and I'll frustrate the video crew because they have to pan their camera again. So, Q quick controls. We hit next. Um, just for now, go a desktop target. If you've plugged in a device or if you installed the SDKs, you should be seeing um, the Android target. You should be seeing other targets as well. Like if I, unfortunately, some of the changes needed for certain platforms aren't upstream. So I've actually got about seven copies of Q Creator on my system. One is just for desktop and cross-compiling to Windows. I don't know why I picked this one today, because I'm crazy. Um, one is just for Android and iOS. One is for BlackBerry and Jolla, and so on and so forth. But if it works on desktop, you can easily get it to work somewhere else. No, no, if you're smart and you like their way of doing it, you can use version control. If you're a masochist like me and use darks, that's not going to help you. Version control in Haskell. There we go. And all this code's there already for us. And rather than reading files, everything goes in a little, this funny QRC thing. All this is, it, it's, um, it means when it makes a binary in the end, rather than having separate files on your file system to be read in, it's going to whack it all inside your binary. Uh, not necessarily because you're an open source hating, I want to obfuscate my code kind of person. Because a lot of mobile devices have these really weird file systems. They don't like you reading separate files from your main application. So we have a profile, which is a QMake, it's a QDism. Um, it tells you we're having an app. We're using QML. We're using the Qt Quick subset, which is the only interesting part of it. And we're using Qt widgets only to um, give us a native style. Other stuff we don't really call, care about. It includes this special deployment file, which is the reason we're using Qt Creator rather than another IDE. It'll, you just press a button and it puts it on Android automatically for you. Um, It'll just take a little while to build using Ant and Java and whatever else. We have some C++ file. We don't even have to touch it. The only reason you want to touch it is if you want to start doing some C++ code to interact or if you want to change the name of your main file. And what we have here is an application window. Rather than having some kind of rectangle or anything else as your element, it's got a specially class window that resizes itself depending on your form factor gives you nice window title bars or not, depending on the device, so on and so forth. It looks like I've stalled long enough for most of us to have caught up. Everyone else, I'm sorry. Bad luck, but we'll get to you soon. Now, no, no more QML scene thing. We're going to run, which will build for us as well. Now, 
if everything's working well in your system and everything's compiled well, this is just the boilerplate code they gave us, everything should work by default. So you see we've got button elements. If we put this on an Android device, they'll look like Android buttons. Same for other platforms with native styles. And there we go, fancy little functions. If you've never done it before, all you have to do is modify what they've given you. It's got a nice file menu. And there you can open, all right. They haven't actually done anything with it. But that is your basic desktop template. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to cheat a bit. I'm going to open something I prepared earlier and prepared over a considerable period of time. I might just uh, hide that from your view for a second. You can keep admiring the example. Right, so it'll take a while because I've got lots of custom files being loaded, lots of classes, and then I'll run it. Sorry, my laptop's really hating this screen resolution. Alright, so you can have multiple projects open. If it's in bold, it's the active project. Should just close that. It's building, it's running. There we go. This is something designed for mobile rather than for desktop, but we can always go back into a more desktop mode. Um, I've deployed this, I did this once when I was still more into research. You can load things off the internet. You can part. Um, it uses basic um, XML HTTP requests, get, um, push, so on and so forth. And um, 3D isn't quite working, so I haven't found anything yet for us today with the 3D model. Just to demonstrate some of what you can do once you put some time into things, you can check on the conference Wi-Fi. So we'll leave that for now. So everything now that you see with the little uh, scroll wheels and scroll panels will just be a normal flickable thing on a mobile device. Um, so not terribly exciting if you are not a biologist, but it just gives you something to look at what you can do. This is something I made when I'd never experienced QQuick before. Um, I had written this all in C++. It took me about four months. I ported it to QQuick in about two days. And it's got all this kind of crazy parsing. I was originally going to do all the calculations, parsing, making, drawing 3D protein backbones in C++. The speed in JavaScript is comparable anyway. So I'm reading a file with 20,000 lines and doing regex operations, and it only takes about 20 seconds in most phones, JavaScript engines. So we'll go back to our little example here. Um, close that. Actually, no. I lie, I'll be indecisive again. I will open something else I prepared earlier that's much simpler. So in the meantime, please be building the example, checking it's working in your system and it's running. We're kind of stalling because I know a couple of people are having issues. No SDKs found. Did you choose the desktop target? Or Android. Desktop. Okay, I'll be with you in a minute. All right. So this took about fifteen minutes to make. And if someone wants to come up and have a play while well, I look over here, go for it. Volunteer. Uh, I'm not missing anything. You're not missing anything at all? Okay, so what, what's, I, what's the actual error? When I go to...
All right. So this application is really, really crazy because it literally takes the width of the screen and divides it up based on pixel size. It's suitable for a phone. I can show it to you on a phone in a second and pass it around. All of these, you can fit about four of these objects in a grid on a phone because I used um, numerical squaring before they ported all these fancy components over. It's hard to see what it's doing. All I've got is a series of pictures and it flips them over to check if there's something underneath. You can install that now from the Google Play Store. It's a really horrible thing. As I said, it took 15 minutes to do and it'll actually work on your phone but because it's not taking different aspect ratios into account and all of that and screen resolutions, if I ran this on a retina display, it would look horrible. Egg hunt. Show. All right. We've had a couple of people having problems getting things to work, but for now, um, just open up the example, have a bit of a play, change some of the things here. This message style is a bit complicated. All the logic, main logic here is in this second for, form called mainform.ui.qml. I'm not sure why they gave it such a weird name in this latest release. Um, this file is loaded and displayed, um, and that's most of your logic for your application. I get the little weird hourglass symbol. Ah, oh, sorry, I've used quick design. Ah, oh, they made it too complicated. All right, so what we can do here, we can ditch this, this main form. All this does here, if it finds another QML file in the same directory, um, which is the same name, and you put it here as an object, it loads it instead. That main form is a bit too complicated for us. So what we're going to do is go File, um, New File or Project, Qt, QML File. and just save that there. And we're going to get rid of this main form business. And I'll just comment it out. I'll delete it. No. And put main page instead. And now everything we put in this file gets dumped into there. And now we're back with an environment we're familiar with. And all the example boilerplate code already gives us a system menu, everything else. If you run it on Android, it'll use an Android menu. And we can get cracking very shortly. I mute my microphone, I'll explain again what I just did. Um, they've given us a very complicated example now with the latest version of Qt. We don't actually want to touch that. So, we can keep things main.qml exactly where it is. We created a new file called mainpage.qml and you can call it anything you want. You just put the same name here as long as it starts with a capital letter and it will work. So, And that's it. We can add more code to it here for the real one, or we can work entirely in here. So now, if we run this application, no, sorry about that. Die. Quit. Close. And there we go. We've replaced everything we had in the middle, all those fancy buttons and everything else, with just our rectangle element here. So you can use this boilerplate as a code, uh, as a base, um, to keep going away. Can you go back and do the main? All I did here, I got rid of this main whatever else they used to have, and put main page there instead. So we're not using the other file that they had by default. I made a new QML file and I put its name there. What I could do, I could now make another new file. It remembers what I picked. No, it doesn't. Q 
new quick 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 file, choose, call it other thing dot qml. Same thing. Do something so I can tell it's different from the other one. If I go back to main qml um, main dot qml, I can now add other thing. Nothing special, nothing fancy. It straight away knows because it's in the same directory. It can import it in. I now have that's main page, the white one, and other thing is this yellow one over the top. And this way you can start cleaning up your projects and have everything in one massive file, which you have to comment everywhere and then gets to 10,000 lines. You don't know what it means. So did you manage to install the egg hunt program? <laughs> All right, I'll get the actually. It's um, oh, how do you do that with players? It's look for t it's tk dot thomas m dot egg hunt. Thanks. Without the height and the width, a lot of elements um, have their own intrinsic size. Like if you do a text element. It's just there, by default the, the size of the text, but um, a rectangle is not visible. By default it has a width of zero and a height of zero. So what you can do instead, if you want to fill the entire page, say with this, um, rather, if you want to still keep it a rectangle so we get a nice color, we can use anchors. Parent. This way we don't even care what the parent is, we don't have to know. It's going to fill the parent and uh, what's your favorite color? Blue. There we go. <coughs> and now our entire upper window is filled with a nice blue rectangle that can be our background. How about window? Uh, uh, the application window, does that uh, automatically fit to the, the whole window? Um, no, I was going to get to that later. We might as well do that now. This application window, width and the height. Um, it's good to specify something if it's going to be on the desktop for it to, in case someone minimizes it. Even if you make it, um, say for example, you can put, it's best to keep everything in the other file, but you can put a text element here. If you've got things that seem one there, one in the file. It will scream and complain. But you can put extra elements, extra objects, extra children in each file. But if you set the same property twice, it will complain. Right, so now we can make, say, the width, the text dot width. And now it starts off the width of this text. Um, you can also set application window. If it's going to be on a desktop, you can set it to be full screen, optimized. You can give it any window flag, like a, you can make it an X11 splash screen. You can make it... Um, a Windows special video form. As long as it works on that platform, you can do anything you like with it now. I'll change the syntax. So, <coughs> all right. So, especially with these newer components, it's a bit much for myself to remember everything. But thankfully. You go to the object you're looking for help with and press F1. It'll take a couple of seconds the first time it's done it. It'll open this nice helpful help view on the side. So we'll just find out how to make it full screen and go from there. Oh, it's a window, so we have it's inherited from the window class, so we'll have to go there. And um, here we go, flags. So I would have to look up how to do that, but you can give it a full screen flag as well. It'll just be a two, two-second Google search, or looking at another project that I made, which I shouldn't have closed. Um, but as I said, anything which you can do for a normal cute application window, you can do here, and it'll automatically just ignore it on a mobile device and go full screen anyway. Same for a tablet. 
Now, at this stage, given this is a bit of a new experience for most of us, do you want to continue on and make a nice app, or do you want to start putting it onto mobile devices to show how to do that? Not really fast? Do both? Why not both? <laughs> All right, fantastic. Yes, question? Are there any guides to um, sort of like what you need to do to make sure it's going to be exactly the same on a mobile device and a desktop? Because um, in, there are some sort of corner cases where um, using a component is not going to work the same on an Android device as it will on a desktop. And the example I can think of there is the uh, media player. Yes. Um, you can play a JPEG file in the media player on Linux, but if you try to do that on Android, it crashes. Unfortunately, there's no automated testing for corner cases like that. A lot of the things, they deliberately allow you to do whatever your host operating system lets you do. So if you try and put in extra features, which say, even if they work on desktop Linux, or on my Drolla smartphone here, but not on an Android device or a Windows desktop, um, it's up to you, unfortunately, to test that on the platform. However, the media player will play most videos on all platforms. It, it's, a, it's more of a platform issue. Same as if I try to play um, an H.264 file on a Linux distribution, which doesn't allow non-free codecs, it's going to fail as well. But other than that, generally, if you file a bug, someone will get to it very quickly and try and make sure everything's compatible. Again, if anything, I'm going to run this silly example on Android now. Um, and it should be exactly the same, except rather than having a menu bar, a file menu, and window controls, it should actually have a nice Android menu, Android menu for us. So someone's kindly given me um, this Android tablet and didn't give me the password for it. There we go, that should work. Now, just run my Android Qt Creator rather than my Windows one. Well, who was saying before I didn't have any kits installed? Okay. If, if you do install everything, you can go afterwards and add SDKs to try and cut down on the number of things you have. Just uh, wait for it to unfreeze itself because it's searching my entire file system, which is encrypted for every single Android every SDK I've ever installed, which is a lot. There we go. So, it's found all of that. It's going to find Android API level. These are what they call kits for different devices. And unfortunately, my Android kits are for an early acute version. But um, I'll run that in a second. I will just add kit Android for. I'm guessing it's going to be that, this tablet. I should have asked. There we go. Let's pick Android instead. That's right, make a new build directory for me. That's fine. I don't care where you chuck it. It automatically goes then and generates for us um, our Android deployment file, which if anyone's deployed to Android before, it's... Uh, Quite a pain in the neck. We'll have a look while it's building. And it's doing all the ant rubbish for us. And it's not. Configuration is faulty. I do apologize. I don't have the proper um, Android configuration for this device. Did anyone just in install the Android SDK now? I think you can to this Uh, all right, excellent. I might try that one. Okay, everybody else who brought their own device with them. 
grab your fancy micro USB cable, unless you brought an iPhone, in which case bad luck. Insert into your phone. Depending on your phone and who it's from and where it's from, you might have to do some fancy enable debugging option on your phone or something like that. And then you go back to Qt Creator. You, in you install the SDKs from the disk. Everyone got their disk to their hard drives? No? Who's still missing an SDK? All right, were you after... Have you got, have you got an optical drive? No. All right. Is it working now? Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, if you're using a nice, stable distro like Debian, it's not going to have um, the best, the most up-to-date configured development packages. Um, or you can just have everything crazy like on my system, which, so it stops working every two months like this just did. Okay, this worked yesterday. I've just had a system update this morning, and it's crashed. So I will run it off the SDK, SDK like everybody else. We saw that spindle somewhere here. Fantastic. Ah, I look. Yes. Oh, the, the window flags for Qt. Um, yes, you can do it. I've unfortunately forgotten how to do it offhand. Ah, oh, sorry. Okay, just do that in a minute when the sun freezes. No, I think. So, what was the property? Is it a QML property? We're talking about changing it from C++. No, QML. So. Uh huh. And oh, they must inherit from window. Do you know what the value is by any chance? See if that does it. I'll switch back to desktop. Ah, oh, that's not full screen. Oh, so it's full screen, but we wanted um, not maximized. We wanted without borders. Right, so the whole list of different um, window states pops up here, and you'll just—it's just a matter of picking the appropriate one. The other misleading thing is on my system, I don't allow windows to go full screen, so it's probably not going to be the best demonstration for that. Yeah, so you can change the window state to different sizes, and it should work on a normal person's machine. I don't know. Well. I'm glad you've all come today. Um, to be honest with you, I planned a rather more technical talk, and all of zero people would have come along to that. So I'm glad you're all bearing with me while I'm doing things a bit off the cuff. So please, if you've got something that you've realized that there's something you'd like to work with, I know we're still scattered about the ecosystem. You might just, um, if you want, feel free, go nuts, start throwing components together, and try and make something that looks kind of decent. I might just go around the room one by one and help you deploy onto your phones. Does everyone think? Have I covered enough? Does it make enough sense for us to do that? Or is still really not enough information to go that far? All right, so we'll go back into the basics again. All right, let's, let's all do an app together. It'll be fun. What do we want to do? A game, mortgage payment, processor. A chart, um, usually, but I, honestly, that's not something I do, so I wouldn't remember it off, off hand. Flappy Bird. Uh, Flappy Bird? We can do that. <laughs> no. You know I've been writing it for the past five months. It does not work. Anyway, um, so let's... Um, Oh, sorry about that. I said, I did that 15 minutes. Someone said, why didn't I make any apps for Easter? If, if you don't mind coming out here and... It doesn't auto-rotate. It doesn't auto-rotate. I've never even tried it on a tablet. It doesn't auto-rotate. 
So that's the app I was showing earlier. Um, it kind of works in a tablet, but because I just decided to fit as many images as I could by pixel size into a screen, it's still huge. If you run it on a phone, which is the only thing I tested it on, you only get about 3 by 5 and it's great for 5 year olds. It's fantastic, they play it for hours and they think they're so smart. <laughs> but um, no, Fl Floppy Bird, I have to admit I've never actually played Floppy Bird, so I don't quite know what it is. There's something about a bird not hitting rectangles or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. call it Hoppy Tux. Hoppy Tux? <laughs> Alright, so... What we need, what we need is a tux, all right? Let's make a new file to be our tux. Because I like keeping everything nice and organized. Well, seriously, deployment issues. We'll, we'll do it at the end for everyone wants to stay into lunch, maybe. We'll just make something cool and we'll work. There's no point knowing how to deploy it if it's no fun. So, tux.qml. Let's, um... So if you can run that on an Android phone and see if it's any different again. All right, so let's make Tux an image as his base class. Let's uh, steal a picture of Tux from Wikipedia. Just a moment. Unless, is there a standard Tux image on everyone's file system in the same location? Probably not. No, and um, the conference Wi-Fi has kicked me off again for downloading too many SDKs and pictures of mops. So, if can someone point just to us to? Sorry, has anyone got a URL for a tux image before I make us all use a mop? Try people searching for tux to use it. Oh, that'd be great. I'm saying I've I've been kicked off the uh, conference Wi-Fi for. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Ah, oh, fantastic, the Ethernet. Excellent. I was paying attention during my AV orientation. I forgot these things still existed. There we go. And they hit me too. There we go. Thank you, University, for providing this Wi-Fi which we use, which is extremely slow and can't load a Wikipedia page. You might do that. Let's look for Tuz. Oh, there we go. Sorry, we can change it to Tuz later. Maybe it can be an upgrade. Okay, copy image location. The smart thing to do is to download this file into a local directory, which is what you're going to do eventually anyway if you're going to make a game out of this. The lazy thing to do is just load the URL. Guess what we're going to do right now? God, what? Sorry. Oh, I hate this. The actual... No. Just to cycle through all my useless activities. Here we go. These are going to be some... Ah, go away! Right. Sorry, presenter can't even control his own computer. I seriously do not know what's happening. Oh, I've got a phone on my keyboard. <laughs> Alright, go away. Funny that. Oh, I have a. They must have uh, banked up a lot of key presses there. Anyway, so without waiting for me to do it, because it's going to take 5 million years, find source code, or find a URL for a tux image. And uh, pop it in there as a source. All right, bear with me for a moment. Let's uh, kick X in the guts. It always fixes everything. So what we're going to need, thinking about this, if we want to have a game with a little tux that goes up and down, we need an image class for our tux. How are we going to control them? Arrow keys or with the mouse and gestures? 
So touch screen. Oh, what, tap up, tap down. Or do you, do, you, do you tap on... I don't have them play Fluffy Bird. Do you actually touch the bird yeah, itself? Each time you tap, it just goes up by... Oh, you tap anywhere? Okay. So what we have to do, what I want to do, we want a mouse area with anchors to fill the entire root window. So put that in your, your code now. It's mouse area, open curly bracket, anchors.fill colon parent, close curly bracket. And we'll have an event that if you press on it, an unpressed event, if you press on it, it'll increase the uh, height of our tux. So we'll have a tux, put it into a separate file in case we want to do a lot of logic for it as well into the file itself. Um, don't put an ID for the tux in the file open it as well. And make tux a child of whatever's going to have hold our mouse area. Our background can be either a rectangle with a nice colour, or you can find a nice picture of clouds or something like that, and be an image to set the source. Full screen, make sure you give it a Z value that's low, or you make it higher up in the hierarchy than other children, so it doesn't cover everything else. <coughs> right. I would put the image in a separate file as well, in case we end up doing a lot of logic there. Or if we want to add extra tuxes or something silly like that for, for multiplayer. You need multiplayer tux, right? The smart thing to do would be to check if you've got a tablet or something with a big enough screen. Alright, so we have 10 minutes to motor through and make ourselves a game. Let's see what we can make. You should be ahead of me because I'm starting from scratch because I lost everything because I didn't save it. Does anyone have a URL for a tux image? Wiki. Moral that story: Never leave an Android device on your on your keyboard because they're extremely heavy. All right. Um, so. Right. So where should our tuck start? Does he start about the middle of the screen? So we'll we'll keep it easy. We'll use x and y coordinates. So we'll make his x zero. Y parent dot height over two 
and we can just set that later and change it. Now what do we want? A mouse area. Has so anyone actually implemented this already? Where are we at? I've never played Floppy Tux, whatever this is going to be called. So what happens when you press? So I, I think I have to, if you don't press anything, then it needs to fall to the bottom of the screen. Ah. And if, if it reaches the bottom of the screen, then it's game over. Alright, there's several ways to do this. We're going to do it the way that teaches something new. We're going to use a timer element, which guess what that does? Um... So. How fast does he fall, roughly? Too fast. Too fast? <laughs> okay, so in 20 milliseconds he hits the bottom? Yeah. All right, well, we'll just put some numbers in and we'll see what it does. We'll go the engineering way. Um, oh, what do we need an idea? Okay, you can fall a pixel at a time. As you can see, I plan everything really well in advance. So, get unpressed. Let's make it easy. All right, let's uh, see if this works. No, I think that's a bit too fast. <laughs> tux is too big. Oh, right. I want Tux to go closer to the top of the screen, don't I? Something tells me that's not quite smooth enough and he's not actually falling. So... In interval... Oh, right. Let's find a happy... Not so much medium. Yep. What's the units for that? Milliseconds. So that's two seconds, it's going to go down one pixel. That's going to be really small. See, the smart thing to do, rather than making these pixel values, like the way I felt uh, before, you make it base if it's a percentage of the width of the, or the height of the screen or the width of the screen. Yeah. That can be an exercise for all of you later. I don't print. No. <laughs> So let's um let's make Tux a lot smaller, shall we? Ah. No. No, what am I doing? Is Y is zero? It's like I'm gonna start, make this easier. You know what? That would be great. Um, we can't stay. I think, is there a boff in this room during lunch? All right. Anyone who's interested, we can have an unofficial boff somewhere else because we've only got four minutes left. All right. So. I was just saying it would be nice to have the penguin. Yeah.
It'd be great, actually. Oh, if we get that logo, that would be fantastic. Right, we've got about three minutes. Who can see the error in my code? Because I'm going too fast. I'm not thinking. I'm not. Pr is that the university system? What's smaller than five is fifty. The problem is, is, is falling too fast. Let's. Uh -huh. I think that fraction of a second. We'll make it one second, shall we? All oh. oh, right. <laughs> I can do mathematics. No, what? How does that make sense? Um, if it's meant to be falling. So the bottom, the the top zero zero is the top left hand corner. So the height is the bottom. You know what? We can um, make this easier for ourselves. Ah, oh, back to yeah. <laughs> All right, so I want the Y. Yeah. Indeed, actually. So, I, yes. Oh, that's a reserved property. Okay. I do that. Right, I've got 30 seconds. Do we have a falling tux or not? No. All right, so. Greater than height. Greater. Oh, I do. I keep flipping this the wrong way around, don't I? Greater. No. Greater than the height. He's starting at the top. He's starting at zero. Every time the timer kicks off, he goes lower. Um, why isn't this working? The height is zero, so why is zero bigger than main page at height? Got about five seconds left. Shouldn't be zero, better not be zero. It's failing at the start. Main page is apparently negative 22 pixels high. There we go. Oh, right. So let's... Um, that's where we're intelligent people, unlike me, have a button. We should need cute quick components. Our controls, rather, as they're called now. Is it okay to ask questions? Uh, ask, go for it. Um, can you develop using these two for uh, an iOS and Apple? You can. As, as of Qt 5.4, um, if you download the proper Xcode libraries to work with it, um, Qt installs, it detects everything. Uh, in that case, unfortunately, you can't use open source Qt, which is why I don't know too much about it. So the question was whether you need a Qt commercial license. I'm not sure about the Apple App Store's policies. I believe you will. In which case, it's possible, but you have to buy the commercial license. I believe it's the same. I believe it's the same situation for Windows RT. But um, there we go. The world's slowest falling tux. He goes off the screen when you click on him. So, actually, we'll take that outside now. Let's take it outside now. Everyone who's interested, we'll meet up outside. Thank you all for your interest. Um, where shall we go? Very quick, we have to get out of this room. Well, we'll, we'll wrap it up first. Yeah, we'll wrap it up. Meet outside the door. So, everyone, please give a big thank you to Thomas. And on behalf of LCA, please take your skip, speaker's gift for you. Ah, thank you kindly. That's all right. Thanks all. Let's go outside. We'll figure out where we